two weeks ago, um, we left church here on, on two weeks ago, a Sunday, we left, and three of my boys, I have four boys, a little girl, and uh, three of my boys jumped in my car, and we, we left for the day, but we quickly found ourselves hunched over my, my phone, watching one of the greatest comebacks that we had ever seen in modern sports history. You may already know where I'm going with this. We were, we, we were watching as Tiger Woods was navigating the last few holes of the 2019 Masters Tournament over there in Augusta, Georgia. And we watched as he, we tuned in just in time for him to uh, complete 17, uh, get, jumped on the tee of 18, teed off, um, began to work his way through the fairway of 18. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm a major golf fan, like I played in high school. Don't let that impress you, by the way. But I played, and I love that game. I love the game of golf. I love watching it. It's, a, it's like a stress relief for me to watch it and to go play it. Uh, I know it causes a lot of you probably a lot of stress to go watch it and play it. But for me, it's a stress relief. But we watched as he was through, going through the, uh, the fairway, and then he got onto the green, and he um, two-putted to win the um, 2019 Masters Tournament. But what we didn't really understand, and I thought about this later, is we were really watching one of the greatest comebacks in career history in, in modern sports. If you know anything about Tiger's uh, last decade, it's been riddled with, um, it's, just, it's just been full of injuries and full of trying to get his swing back literally and figuratively in his life, a lot of scandal in his personal life. He is clawed, no pun intended, with trying to get his life back in order, in, both professionally in the sport and also personally but last, two weeks ago, he found himself standing on the 18th green, finally able to feel what it means to win again. And this is Tiger, who has 81 professional wins. He's got 15 major championships, just three shy of the all-time leader, Jack Nicholas. He's got five green jackets, master champions, which is, if you think, I read this, I think this is true. Like, he's got three, he, he, he holds championships in three different decades, like the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s. That's impressive. Like, really, imp- y'all aren't impressed. But that's impressive. <laughs> like, as a golfer, that's impressive. But he finally is beginning to understand what it means to win again. So he stood on that green. I love this picture that we have of Tiger. He stood on this green if you follow Tiger's career, he always wears the red shirt, the black pants on a, on a Sunday. And this is taken on the 18th green after he put it in on, uh, to win. And we finally get to see that fist pump that we all know Tiger has, holding the putter high. And he's letting out this roar because he is so excited. If you watch the coverage, you know he was hugging everybody that he could hug that day. Like he felt what it meant to win again. And maybe for some of us, myself included, it's maybe been a while in some of our areas of our life where it's been a minute since we felt like we've actually won in life. I'm not talking about a sport or golf or, you know, baseball or a board game. I'm not talking about winning in life. What it means to wake up and feel like we actually have accomplished something, like we're actually winning in life. Well, over the next five weeks, we're going to start unpacking, starting the day, this new series called Hashtag Winning. Hashtag winning, and this, the reason we picked that name is because it's a popular hashtag within the social media. It really takes on two connotations. There's a positive connotation that people use this in their posts, whether on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, or if you're hanging still on MySpace, God help you. Like, that's, like, <laughs> come on, people. Like, it's got a positive connotation. It's got a negative connotation. So the positives like this, like, for you moms out there, you know this is true. Like, if you post on Facebook or, or Instagram, Got the kids up, got them dressed, got them fed, no fights, everybody's at school, hashtag winning. Like, like that's a win, right? Like, you feel like you accomplished something. Then there's always this negative kind of poke fun at ourselves, kind of, we, we, we may be kind of the idiotic moment of the day. And we, for instance, like, you know, driving to work today, coffee flew everywhere as I hit the brakes, hashtag winning. Right? Like, you, you know what I'm talking about. Like, people kind of poke fun at themselves. But what we're doing here over the next five weeks is we're going to be unpacking what it means to win from a biblical perspective. Because we don't need another pep talk, right? We don't need another um, just motivational speech. But we're going to look at it through the biblical perspective of what it means to win in five key relationships of our life. Next week, we're going to unpack what it means to win in marriage. The following week, we're going to unpack what it means to win in parenting. We're probably going to need overflow for that day. Um, 
We're going to unpack what it means uh, to win in our finances. We're going to unpack what it means to win in our work. But today we're actually going to start with which, what I feel is probably the most foundational of all of them. Like we have to understand what we're going to talk about and unpack this morning before we can build on the rest of them for the rest of the series. And that is uh, unpacking what it means to win in worship. What it means to win in our relationship with God. I am one class after this semester, um, three hours, away from completing my master's degree. Um, <laughs> don't clap just yet. We're not done. Um, but I, I'm doing it on, in, in master's in worship studies. And um, over that period, of, over this many, many year period of trying to get this thing knocked out, I've run across a lot of different definitions of worship. And, and I hang out in that world of worship. I, I obviously am your worship pastor here. I write worship songs. I have a lot of conversations with different other worship leaders and writers and influencers in the world of worship. And so I've come across a lot of different definitions of worship. And we've even talked about a lot of different definitions of worship over the years here at Gateway. But I just, I want to highlight three as a really kind of a springboard to where we're going to go this morning. The first one is this. Dr. Warren Wiersbe is a fantastic scholar uh, on worship, really just biblical scholar all around. And he says this. He says, worship is the believer's response to all they are, mind, emotions, will, body, to what God is and says and does. And then Harold Best a guy you probably never heard of, maybe you have, but he writes this about worship. He's a, a scholar in the world of understanding worship. He says, worship is the sign that in giving myself completely to someone or something that I want to be mastered by it, right? But this is perhaps probably my favorite definition of worship from someone here on this earth. Louis Giglio, um, if you've hung around anything of worship culture, that probably is a name that you're familiar with, but he's the pastor over at Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia, um, kind of the lead visionary architect of the Passion Movement, which has influenced thousands of college students all over the world, myself being one of them, my wife being one of them, probably some of you. We sing a lot of the Passion songs here uh, at Gateway. But he writes this. He says this, worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who he is, for what he's done, expressed in and by the things we say, and by the way that we live. It's a pretty encompassing definition of worship. And we can take all of three of those and put them all together and, th and, and, and find similarities and differences. But at the end of the day, none of those definitions of worship can exist without how Jesus defined worship. We can, can, we're gonna, we can comb through the New Testament and find many, many instances where Jesus spoke on worship. But this morning, I want, to, I want to pull apart a scripture passage. Maybe that's one of those familiar coffee cup, put it on a t-shirt verses that you're probably familiar with. But line it up in this idea of what it means to win in worship, what it means to win in our relationship with God. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd love for you to open them up to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be hanging out in the back half of that. If you don't have a Bible with you, the, the scripture's on the screen. And, and, and by the way, if you don't own a Bible, like if, you don't, like if you're new to the faith, if you're just checking out Gateway, uh, let myself, let Pastor Chris know, let someone on staff know, we'd love to get a Bible in your hands. Like that's, that's, that's the least we could do. It's the core foundation of what our faith is centered on, so we'd love to get a Bible in your hands. But we're going to be hanging out in Mark chapter 12 at the end of it. Let me give you a little bit of context to kind of get you up to speed of what we're talking about here. Jesus is in the late, late days of his ministry on here on earth. And if we even pull back to chapter 11, we're finding that he is uh, in the temple courts at the time. And a lot of the religious leaders of the day are beginning to surround Jesus. And they're beginning to question his authority. They're beginning to ask him a lot of hot topic questions of the day in the Jewish culture. Everything from should we, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Um, tell, what's up with all this idea of like resurrection from the dead? Like he's, they're, they're throwing things left and right um, in hopes of tripping him up in his words. In hopes of kind of derailing that they can maybe have something to accuse him of. But we all know that Jesus and his Jesus ways, he answers very eloquently and very correctly. And they just can't seem to trip him up. But then we get down to what we're talking about today. And another religious leader, some think he was a lawyer, some say he was a teacher. Mark calls him a scribe. Shows up on the scene and asks him what seems like a very sincere question. He shows up and, he, and he wants to ask this question. It's probably a question that um, the culture of the day would talk about a lot. 
within their circles, right? Everybody's got circles that they talk about. Everybody would ask maybe this question, discuss this question, but they were too scared maybe to even ask this question. Except for this guy, he shows up. And that's what brings us to where we are in Mark chapter 12. It says this, starting in verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, asked him, what command is the most important of all? See, religious leaders of that day were obsessed with the law. They were obsessed with commandments. They were obsessed with trying to navigate how all these laws worked and how they all looked. And that was really their job. That was their job on the scene to do. They were the religious leaders of the day. There were some like 614-ish laws that these guys had to keep up with. 300 and odd something were what they called negative laws, negative, negative commandments that said basically said, don't do this. Don't do that. Be sure and stay away from this. Don't, don't do this. And there was 200 and some odd that were positive and saying, be sure and do this. You want to do these. These are the things that are good. But we have the scribe that shows up on the scene and basically is saying, look, Jesus, part of my job is to keep up with all this, and it's becoming a little bit daunting. And so could you maybe give some insight, Jesus, into what is the greatest of all these laws? Like if, if everything fell apart here in, in religious temple world, What's the greatest commandment? What's the one thing we should focus on? And Jesus answers it this way in verse 29. He says this, the, more, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. You see, Jesus didn't just pull this answer out of thin air. Jesus knew the Jewish culture He knew what he was talking about. He knew how to answer the question the scribe gave. So he reached back to what we call the Torah. I'm not going to get all biblical scholar on you, but I understand what we're talking about. He reached back to the first five books in the book of Deuteronomy, and he recognized that this answer needs to come out of what they call the Shema. So Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see, the Shema, say Shema. Shema. The Shema was the central prayer of the whole Jewish prayer book. It was the very, very first thing that, that Jewish children would learn. They would, they would soak this prayer in, this love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. They would soak it in. This was the very first thing they would learn. And the Jewish people would repeat it twice a day. And they valued and they, and, and they loved, they centered everything of their heart and mind and soul and strength on this scripture. So much so they would they literally write it on pieces of paper and they would tuck it in boxes and they would fix it to their forehead and they would fix it to their hands. And they would, they would, they would literally write it on the, their doorposts of their home. They would write it on the gates of the entrance to their house. Why? Because in Deuteron- Deuteronomy, if you skip down a few chapters, it says that it, It says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. They took it literally. It wasn't some figurative, abstract ideology. They took it literally to do that because it meant so much to their culture. You see, Shema, at its its core, is translated to listen. And some scholars have broken it apart even more to to, to mean to focus on. And that's what Jesus was trying to make a point that that day in, in the temple with the scribe and all the other religious leaders. He was trying to bring it back around full circle to this idea, like, of all the of all of all the commandments we have, I know you've got a lot to keep up with, but this is the one I want you to focus on. To love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Yes, if everything were to hit the fan and everything needs to go and everything went away, and this is the only law we had we, we focus on, this is the one I want you to focus on. And here today, April 28, 2019, this is what he's still calling us to do. If we want to understand what it means to win in worship, win in our relationship to God, then this is where it begins. This is the core of what it means to win. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. So this morning we're going to take those four and we're going to unpack them quickly and just take a look and see what 
through a biblical lens, practically, what it means to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let's, let's start at the top. Jesus says, first and foremost, that we're supposed to love him with our heart. Love him with our heart. What is, what is Jesus, when he says that to the scribe, what is he saying? Well, he's not talking about that organ that's, that's beating blood through our veins and through, through our whole body right now. He's not, he's not talking about that heart. He's talking about the very core, the very central depth of who we are that houses our emotions, that houses our wills, that house, houses our affections. Let's hang on that word affections just for a minute. See, affections is something that we all have. We all have affections for different things. But affections are defined, I like to define affections like this. It says affections are the things that steer our lives. Affections are the things that steer our lives. The things that we wake up in the morning going, this is what I'm most focused on. This is, what I, this is what's driving everything in my life right now. These are the affections. And the same is true for our affections um, for God. These, what, what, are the, what are the affections? What, do we have an affection for God? I like to think about our affections as like a ship. We have the ship on the, on the screen real quick. Kara and I have been on a couple cruises, and, I'm, and every time we, both times that we pulled up, I've always been amazed. Maybe you've seen this, like how big a, a cruise ship is. Like it's massive, and you get on it, and you feel like it's never going to end. Like it's, it's like a small city. And this is not a cruise ship; it's a cargo ship of sorts. But you notice what's on the very back of it, on the bottom? It's a rudder. See, our affections are like a rudder on a ship. They literally steer our lives. When that captain turns that boat to the left and that rudder begins to shift, and even the smallest shift can move that entire vessel as large as it is to the left. The same is for the right. It moves to the right, it moves it to the right. When it straightens up, it goes straight. And our affections are the same thing as a rudder. They steer our lives. Same is true for our affections with Jesus. How do, we, how do we determine our affections? I have to ask ourselves some hard questions. What occupies our time? Like, if we, we scanned our day in a 24-hour period, what occupies our time the most? Is it, a, is it work? Is it, is it a, a particular relationship? Is it a hobby? Is it nothing at all? Is it laziness? Like, that, that can be an affection, that you do nothing at all, Right? What motivates our actions? Again, what, what do we wake up in the morning first and foremost that hits our brain first? Those, that's, that's what reveals our affections. Let me, let me clear the air real quick. Uh, having affections for things are not a bad thing, okay? I love Tex-Mex, okay? You Nashville people don't have it right, okay? This Texas boy, y'all, y'all need, y'all need, never mind. Y'all need to work on that. I love baseball. I love watching baseball. We're a baseball family, and we love watching baseball. We love playing baseball. I coach with Charles down here. We, we love it. Like, it's, it, we're a baseball family. I love it. There's a lot of things that, that I could just list that I love that I have an affection for. But the danger is this, is when I misplace my affections. The danger is when I misplace my affections, because where our affections lie is where our heart lies also. Matthew says it best in 621. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You see, the heart, the very depth of who we are that houses our, our affections, our will, and our emotions, it's a battleground. There are things always vying for our heart's attention. I like to think about it this way, that there's, there's a throne that sits on our heart. And it's not, a, it's not a love seat. It's not a sectional. It's not a, like this couch that we can just stack up our affections. It has room for one. And when we place anything other than Jesus on the throne of our heart, then we fall into this trap of idolatry. And it's easy to fall into and not even know we're doing it. See, idolatry can be defined by this. Warren Wiersbe defines this, uh, idolatry as this. An idol is simply a substitute for God or a supplement to God. An idol is simply a substitute for God or a supplement to God. I've never thought about it that way until I read that, that definition. I've always, maybe you're like me, you grew up in church and you heard the story of Moses and the golden calf. Like, that was an idol. Like, they, they, they substituted the calf for, the, for, the, for God. But if you put it in perspective, how many times do we actually fall into the trap of actually just supplementing God with something? Thinking that we've got God in the right place, but we're adding something to it. That still falls us into the trap of idolatry. 
I think Paul, based, I think he understand, understood it the best when he wrote this in Philippians, of what it meant to treasure Jesus above anything else. He writes this. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You see, Paul understood what it meant to treasure Jesus. If you know anything about Paul, you know that in his former life, he was anything but Jesus. Like, he anything but a fan of Jesus. But he's now saying, as he writes this to the church, He's saying, listen, everything else is trash. Everything else is rubbish. Everything else will quickly fade away compared to treasuring Jesus. And he found that treasure in Jesus. Loving the Lord God with all of our heart means that we treasure Jesus. So Jesus says this. He says, love God with all of our heart. But he moves on. He says, you're to love God with all of your soul. Now, I grew up in church. I'm a pastor's kid. Um, pretty much been in church my entire life. And I would always hear this word soul. We'd sing about it. We still sing about it here. We'd, I'd hear my dad talk about it. I'd hear just church ling- lingo of this word soul. And I was like, what is this word? Like growing up, like what is this word soul? Are we talking about some dead thing? Like what, what's going on? Like, but our soul is simply this. It's, it's the part of who we are that's the core of who we are that, that dictates our decisions, our lifestyle, our behavior. You see, the heart and the soul are, are kin to each other. And in fact, when we unpack it here, you're going to see a lot of similarities in the heart and soul, but because they do go together, they feed off each other. But the heart has to do with our affections, just like we talked about a minute ago, and our soul has to do with our devotion. Our heart has to do with our affections, and our soul has to do with our devotion. So how do we love God with all of our soul, knowing that? Well, the first way that we love God with all of our soul is through our choices. I said a minute ago, I have five kids, four boys, a little girl. Uh, When Kara and I, when the the, the boys were small, uh, this is something that we said a lot to them. Um, We said, you're not making a great choice. You need to make better choices. Maybe you're a parent. You've said that, like, as you're disciplining your your son or daughter, like, you need to make better choices. I remember we'd always harp on them with that because it was just, we wanted them to understand that everything that they do is based on their choices that they make, good choices or bad choices. And the same is true for us. Everything that we do that flows out of us is based on a choice. I want you to think about how you got here this morning, not how you got to Gateway. I know you got in a car and you rode here, but how you got to this point in life. If you were to scan your brain for the next 10 seconds and think about what are the major events that brought you to this place in 2019, it would all be based on choices. For me, graduated high school in Beaumont, Texas in 1996, made a choice to move to Dallas to go to college. Made a choice to enter into a relationship with my now wife, more on that to come. We got married. We made a choice to get married. We made a choice to start having kids. We made a choice to live in Dallas for 16 years. Then we made a major choice to uproot our family two and a half years ago to move to Nashville. Made a choice to be a part of here at Gateway. We made a choice 10 months ago to adopt a beautiful baby girl. Life is full of choices. Now, amongst all that, there's been some good choices and there's been bad choices. But no matter what, our choices dictate what we treasure the most. See, I told you the heart and the soul go together. Because ultimately, every choice we make comes from what we treasure. See, we do what we value. We, if we treasure our relationship with the Lord, our choices will simply mirror that treasure. Choices flow out of what we treasure the most. So if we have the right thing on the center throne of our heart, then the choices that we make will be the choices that flow out of a kingdom mindset. But when we don't make, when we don't place the right affection on the right thing, that, it, that being Jesus at the throne of our heart, the very center of our life, and the choices that we make do, aren't necessarily lined up in the right way. Loving the God with all of our soul means we, we, we love him with our choices. The second way we do this is by loving him with all of our soul by pursuing obedience. We love him by pursuing obedience. John 14, 15 says this, this, it says this, this if you love me, You will keep my commandments. We could stop right there on this point. It's a great summary to this whole idea of what it means to pursue and to love God with all of our heart by pursuing obedience. You see, love must be demonstrated. 
we've, there's this catchphrase that's been around for decades. It says love is a verb, right? And it's true. Love must be demonstrated. It's an action word, and it's a choice to love. Kara and I have been married 18, 18 years, right? Just making sure. Okay. 18, almost 18 and a half years. And we met in college in Dallas. We were set up on, I always have to think, we were set up on a blind homecoming banquet date. Did you catch that? A blind homecoming banquet date. Awkward. Um, I actually got lost driving to the hotel that the banquet was in. She thinks I did it on purpose, but I really didn't. I didn't know where I was going. Uh, it was one of the most amazing nights because the minute I spent time with Kara, I, I was smitten. Like, I, was, I knew she was it. Her, not so much. Um, we had a great time at this date. I thought things were going awesome. Her, not so much. Um, more to the story. But um, it took me a, another year to get a second date. In fact, our second date was um, the homecoming banquet for our sophomore year. She's going to kill me for telling all the others. In that year period, though, I kept, I kept my head in the game, guys. Like, I was around. Like, I wasn't going anywhere. I was pursuing I'm going to get in trouble. I don't care. She even had another boyfriend Why I was pursuing her, and I still kept my head. That, might, that's, that shows you a lot about who I am, right? I've learned a lot over the 18 years that we've been married, and I'm still learning a lot of what it means to love, and I'm still trying to figure this out. So let me relieve the pressure valve that, guys, husbands, we're, this is an ongoing journey of learning to love our spouse, right? We're always learning how to love them better and how they're, how they're wired. But I've learned a few things. I've learned this, that when I stood before my dad and all of our friends and families, and we stood on January 27, 2001, and we took the vows that I made a commitment to love her even when it was hard to love her. She took the same vow that said that I'm going to love him even when it's hard to love him. And I've learned, especially over the last few months, that I'm having to learn to love Kara how she's wired to be loved and how I think she should be loved. That's a freebie to y'all, you husbands out there. It took a long time, and I'm still trying to figure that out. I learned that I, had, that I have to choose to love her unconditionally whether I feel like it or not that day. And I've learned ultimately that love is not based on the emotion of the moment. The love is not always going to look Instagram perfect. Can we, just say, can we just get clear the air there? Love is not always Instagram perfect, but it's not based on the emotion of the moment. It's not based on the ease of the day or the difficulty of the day. It's a choice for me to get up every day and to love her. And the same is true for our relationship of loving God with all of our soul. It's a choice to daily get up. Focus our minds and our hearts and our soul and all of our strength on him. And to love God by choosing obedience, by taking up a cross daily. Trusting him, loving him, pursuing him. Even when it doesn't feel all warm and fuzzy. Because Lord knows there's a lot of days it doesn't feel warm and fuzzy to love Jesus. But it's our calling within depths of our soul to love him. See, when our devotion is aligned correctly, everything within us, when our devotion is aligned correctly, everything within us, our soul, begins to love God. From the choices we make to the pursuing obedience, that's what he's called us to. So Jesus says, love, me with all, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and then he unpacks what it means to love God with all of your mind. See, we all have a mind. Yes, we all have a mind, right? I hope so. We all have a mind, but the difference between a mind that is of a son or daughter of the kingdom of God, someone who's been rescued and redeemed by, by the cross, versus a mind of this world is that our mind as believers is constantly being transformed, constantly being renewed. At least that's the goal, right? That's what we're supposed to be pursuing, that our mind would constantly be transformed and being renewed. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what does that mean? It means that we are to constantly be pushing our mind to the things of God. And I get it. The mind is another one of those battlegrounds that we often lose the battle on. But we are constantly called to be pushing our mind 
to the things of God. Colossians 3.2 says this, set your mind on things that are above, not on things of this earth. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things on this earth. Why? Because the things of this earth, we all know this, the things of this earth will quickly fade away, but the kingdom is an eternal kingdom that lasts forever. So where do we begin with this? Where do we begin with this idea of renewing and transforming our mind? The thing I think about first is that we constantly need to be thinking on the cross. Again, I get it. The brain, the mind is a constant battlefield. But we overcome the temptations and we overcome the things that want to derail us from our day about constantly thinking on the cross. One of my favorite um, authors is a guy by the name of C.J. Mahaney. You may have heard of him. Uh, great author and pastor. And... Uh, Phenomenal, phenomenal author. I've read a couple of his books. And I think he's my favorite author because he writes really short books. But at the same time, I think he doesn't waste a lot of space on pages. He just gets to the point in the meat of what he wants to say. But in this book called The Cross-Centered Life, Mahaney opens up this whole idea of what it means to constantly have the cross at the forefront of our life and have the cross at the forefront of our mind and basing everything that we have in our life around the cross. And he says this, he says, The cross-centered life is filled with cross-centered days. The cross-centered life is filled with cross-centered days, meaning that every day we choose, it's a choice, right? We choose to put the cross at the very front edge of our day. Yeah, we're going to get a lot of things that come our way, but if we begin to filter it through this idea of keeping the cross at the center of of our day, then we begin this idea of renewing and transforming our mind. Last week, we gathered in this place. Hopefully, you were here. It was an amazing day for Easter, and we celebrated this idea of the cross. We celebrated the idea of an empty tomb. We celebrated the idea that we have hope and that we have life because of the cross. But that's just not a one-day holiday thing that we should be doing as believers and as a church. We should constantly be reminding ourselves that the cross is a center focus of our life. Just as the early Jewish people constantly kept the Shema at the forefront of their mind, we keep the cross now at the forefront of ours because that's what gives us hope. That's what gives us identity. I love Isaac Watts. If you don't know Isaac Watts, he's a prolific hymn writer. Uh, And as a a guy who writes a lot of songs and who leads worship, I'm always drawn back to the hymns. I grew up on the hymns. Maybe you grew up on the hymns. I love a lot of the language in the hymns. But he writes this pretty amazing uh, just verse, lyric. And it says, when I surveyed the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Constantly keeping our mind on the cross. When we think on the cross in all the situations of life, we begin to love him with all of our mind. We begin this idea of what it means to win in worship with all of our mind. Practically, how do we do this? How, how do we, one other way we do this here at Gateway is I, whenever I lead worship, you've heard me maybe say, I want us to remember this morning. I want us to remember. I want us to remember the blessings that God has given us. I want us to remember the faithfulness that God has had for us. Remember the cross. See, remembering is what gives us our fuel for worship. When we just hop in here on a Sunday morning and we start singing, we're, we do nothing else but just spit words off of a screen if we're not constantly remembering why we've even gathered to be in this place to sing. So remembering is our fuel for worship. Psalm 104 says this. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and bless his name. Thanksgiving begins with the first act and the first step of of remembering. That's where our thanksgiving overflows from. Another way that we do this here at Gateway, we're not going to do it this morning, but we do it often enough that it's become part of our identity here at Gateway, is that that's communion. We take communion on a a regular basis here because that's that's what Christ commanded us as his church to do, is to constantly remember his broken body and the blood poured out for him. Paul, Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. He's talking to the, the church at Corinth, and he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're called to remember. We're called to think on the cross. Because by thinking on the cross, by remembering his sacrifice, by remembering his blessings, by remembering his faithfulness, then we begin to understand what it means to love God with all of our mind. 
Jesus doesn't stop there. He gives us three, but he also closes it out by saying, love the Lord your God with all of your strength. We could sum up what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our strength simply by saying this. We're loving him means we give everything of us away. We are all in, 100% in to the things of the kingdom. Yes, we're going to go about our day doing our job and doing school and doing family things, but everything that we do flows out of this idea of giving, us all, giving ourselves all the way, loving him with our strengths. It means loving him with our abilities. It means loving him with our resources. It means loving him with our finances, our time, and our talent. And here's, here's the cool thing about this. Church, when we do this collectively out of pure motives, we become the most unstoppable force with the greatest love message ever seen on this earth that the world needs to hear. Loving God with all of our strength. We do this, we, we've had a couple serve days the last couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully you were a part of those. We were over down in Columbia um, serving at Fresh Start. This is an ongoing initiative that we have here at Gateway. Um, we went down there to kind of give their building a little bit of a facelift. We served lunch to, to their community out there. We just loved on them for a couple of hours through serving and through hanging out together and eating. We also had a serve day over here. We, we braved the cold and the wet, and we, we went over to Berry Farms, which is literally the neighborhood, like just in our backyard, and we're their church in their backyard, and we went over there to just love on them by putting on an egg hunt. And we had hundreds show up to just do that with no intention other than just go, hey, we're going to throw an egg hunt today. We just want to let you know we're in the area. If you want to have a conversation about who this Jesus guy is, then we would love to talk about that with you because we're, we're just here. We're going to be here for you. That's loving God with all of our strength. And we do that by two ways. We do it first and foremost with our hands. Everybody look at your hands. No, really, look at your hands. We don't look at our hands enough, but you can tell a lot about a person when you look at your, when you look at your hands. From, and they're all unique. Everything down from fingerprints to the creases that enter our hands to calluses and the scars. And they all have a unique aspect. And I remember my grandfather's hands. Um, he, worked in, he worked for a contractor in Dallas for years. He's no longer with us. And he, I remember growing up that he would literally come home, and I would grab his hands. When times I was over at their house, and I would grab his hands, and his hands were just rough, like that, that kind of old man rough hands, right? Like, and I remember he would you know, clean up after being working all day, and he would sit in his lazy boy, and he would, he would always eat peanuts, and he would always drink tea. And I remember there were times he would begin to put lotion on his hands because even he, he knew that his hands were rough. You can tell a lot about a man's hands by just by how rough they are and the things they do with their hands. But um, I don't know what you do for a living. Maybe you use your hands um, for what you do on a daily basis. Um, I know for some moms, you, you truly use your hands like every day like to nurture your kids and to take care of them, to, to make sure they're dressed and that they're fed. You wipe noses and you wipe other areas and... <laughs> You literally are loving on your kids. Your kids are a blessing, by the way. They're not a curse, okay? They are a blessing from the Lord. And we take time to love on them, moms and dads, with our hands. We discipline. We, we correct. We use our hands in service. And we use our hands to love God with all of our strength. A couple years ago, back in 2012, I think it was, Kara and I got a chance to go to Cambodia, uh, which is a phenomenal country. That whole trip changed our life. Another story for another day, but... One of the greatest memories that we still talk about today is that we were given an opportunity for about an hour or so to go hang out at a brick factory that was run by indentured slaves of that day. And yes, there's still modern slavery that is existing still in today. And we had an opportunity to, to, to use our hands and we, we, we passed out bags of rice and other food elements and just got to just see the faces of those people light up as we handed them bags of rice and other food and just loved on them through that little bit of time we got to spend. We got to use our hands to love God by loving on them. And here, even here at Gateway, we use our hands in so many different ways. You, you just saw some amazing musicians who use their hands on a weekly basis, amazing production team who use their hands on a weekly basis to make sure that we have an amazing worship experience. They play an instrument. They move a fader. They, they write out songs. They're using their hands. We have workers over in Gateway Kids that for some of us are literally holding with their hands babies 
so that we can come in here as parents and lift our hands in worship. You see the correlation? We're all using our hands within the kingdom. The second way we use, we use our, our body, if you will, to love him with all of our strength is by our feet. Because we literally have been called, the church, the hands and feet of God. The hands and feet of Jesus. So we talk about the feet, and Jesus clearly lays out what it means to win in worship, what it means to love him with all of our strength. In Matthew 28, 19, he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, that word go means that we have to get out of our comfort zone and we go somewhere else that needs to hear and experience the love of God like we've experienced it. That's what brings our feet into the picture is that we go there's two ways that we do that here at Gateway. I've already mentioned some of them, but first way, we serve locally. We get up off of our, feet, off, off our seats and we serve here in Franklin and the, ground, uh, the greater area. We go down to Fresh Starts, which is, an on, again, an ongoing effort that we have. We go serve like at Berry Farms. We are constantly moving our feet to go love and serve the people. And maybe if you're new at Gateway, the second way we do this, if you don't know this, but we have global efforts that we do every single year. We have relationships and efforts in Kenya and Uruguay. And next year we have Cambodia coming online in 2020. And if you've never experienced a mission trip in your entire life, I'm telling you, you're missing out. It's a life-changing experience. When we, Karen and I went together, I've been to India, and Karen and I went to Cambodia together. It, it changed our trajectory, and it changed our life. It changed our perspective because we decided to get off of American soil and plant our feet on something different other than what was familiar. And to love God with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind. And that leads us really to the second part that I really want to unpack before we leave this morning. You see, when the scribe came to Jesus in the temple, he simply asked, Jesus, what's the singular most command that I need to be focusing on? And Jesus answered, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But he gave him a second command, verse 31. He says, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no other commandment greater than these. See, did you see what Jesus did, though? He said, there is no other commandment greater than these. He brought about familiarity, but he also brought something new to the table when he says, look, love me, love God, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but also go love your neighbor the same way you would love yourself. Because you can't separate the two. They go together. They're, they're, they're joined at the hip. And Jesus wants them to understand, listen, love for man grows out of a love for God. How we love God, how can, how, can we, how can we say we love God and not love our neighbor? Love for man grows out of a true love for God. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And back in those days, a neighbor simply meant, from a Jewish perspective, a neighbor simply meant that your neighbor was just another Jew. If they were the same cultural, the same, the same, same uh, religion, that was your neighbor. But Jesus, again, is flipping it on its head by saying, no, 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 your neighbor is anybody you come in contact with, and the same is true for us today. Your neighbor is more than just the person on the left and right of your house or across the street. It is anyone that you have a dealing with, whether it's business, whether it's pleasure, whether it's personal, whether it's going out to eat tonight, whether it's going to the grocery store tomorrow. That is your neighbor. And Jesus says that we are to love our neighbor the same way with the same passion and intention that we would love ourselves. Loving God and loving people. If we had to summarize what Jesus is saying, it would be love God and love people. The truth of the matter is we cannot separate those commands. When we truly love God, then loving people is the overflow of that. Sebastian, come on up. We're, gonna, we're, we're almost done this morning, but I, I wanted to highlight one little thing that God kind of rocked my world as I was preparing this week. I've taught on this a number of times. I've, I've hung out in this passage for a while. But for whatever reason, I've always stopped at verse 31. I've always started at verse 28, and I've always ended on verse 31. But for whatever reason, I just kept reading this week. Kind of embarrassed. I wish I'd have read this a long, long time ago. But I kept reading the story. 
and it starts putting it in all perspective of this idea of this winning series. If we're going to win in the, in, the, in the areas of our marriage and parenting and our finances and our work and winning in this idea of worship, this is what puts it all in perspective. Let's pick it up in verse 32 real quick. And when the scribe, and the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he, he, God, is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Mic drop. Jesus had the original mic drop. He answered so well these questions that no one else dared ask him any other questions. But I really want to go back and focus on verse 33. Where the scribe says this, And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is so much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You see, the scribe was rolling the dice that day when he said this. Because he's literally standing in the temple court surrounded by a bunch of his peers, a bunch of other religious leaders who were trying to trip up Jesus. And he's finally, it's finally clicking in his head. And he realizes, so you're saying, Jesus, that if I love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul and strength and mind, and I love my neighbor as myself. I think I figured you're, that's so much better than all these whole burnt offerings and sacrifices that, that I'm bringing. Because that's, that's, uh, that was part of his job. That was part of his job as a religious leader was to, to help people sacrifice, do sacrifices and burnt offerings. So he was rolling the dice. He was risking it all in front of his own peers to simply say, God, Jesus, I think I hear you right that just loving with everything that I am is so much better than me doing these offerings and sacrifices. See, he's reaching back. He's finally figuring out what David wrote hundreds of years before that in Psalm 51, where he says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, for I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Let me read that again. I want you to really understand. This is what David was writing. He says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. If there's anything I want you to grab out of this morning from everything that we've quickly unpacked, it's this. And you'll notice in everything that we've talked about from winning in worship, this idea of Jesus unpacking what worship looks like, not once have I mentioned a song or singing. And that's what I do here. That's my job. Like I'm supposed to help you understand what it means to sing and offer these songs and write songs. That's what I do. But singing is just one of the arms of worship. We have to understand this truth before we can truly understand what it means to lift our voices. So grab this this morning. What we do when we pull into the parking lot here at 1288 Lewisburg Pike, Franklin, Tennessee, for a 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock service, when we gather like this together, that is not the whole picture of what it means to win in worship. That is not winning in worship. Now don't get me in trouble and email Charlie, okay? It's important that we show up here on Sunday mornings. It's important that we gather together as a collective body and worship together. It's, it's important that we get out in the community and we serve. It's, it's important that we gather in our groups and we have true and authentic community together. That's important, but that's not winning in worship. No, winning in worship is, starts at the foundation of what Jesus was talking about when he said, love God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and then go love your neighbor the same way that you love yourself. And when we do that, these other things that we're going to unpack this month, from marriage to finances and the like, it all has a foundation to rest on. It all has perspective. 
So when we show up here on a Sunday morning, it should just simply be the overflow of what God is showing us and teaching us and moving in us and transforming and renewing throughout the week. That's what a Sunday morning looks like. That's winning in worship. So I want us to just think about that this morning. I want to, I want to first and foremost, as we think and as we reflect, as we close out this morning, I, I want to relieve the pressure of the room going, I don't have all this figured out, and neither do you. Touch the person next to you and look at them and go, I don't have all this figured out. Good. We all agree we don't have this figured out. But here's the challenge. Here's the reality of it. This is a constant pursuit. This is a constant journey. When Paul says that we're working out our salvation, this is what he's talking about. He's saying we're constantly pursuing what it means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love others the same way as we love ourselves. So take a breath and know that that doesn't give you a pass not to try. But it gives you a little bit of relief going know that you've got a community of people around you who are on the same journey as you are. My mentor growing, in, in the early years of my ministry, I had a mentor, David. And he coined this phrase in the last church that I was at. He said, we're a bunch of just messed up people who are moving forward. And that's really what we are. None of us have this all together. But we have the tools and we have the calling and we have the challenge ahead of us. So I'm going to pray for us. And I just want to just spend just a minute just in silence. I know silence can be awkward, but I like it sometimes. Just to just sit there and say, God, what are you showing me this morning? So Father, this morning I'm asking that as we've unpacked all of this this morning. As we've brought it full circle from what you've originally called us to do, to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and now you're calling us to do it now, even in this age. God, that you would begin to just bubble up from the very depths of who we are, the things that we need to work on. So even in this moment of silence, just being still before you, I pray you begin to just bring to mind things. Let's just be still before our God this morning. Ask him what you need to hear, what you need to see. So again, God, I'm asking, um, let this be a pivotal day in the life of our church that we begin to understand what it means to truly worship you and to win in this arena of worship and re- win in our relationship with you. So much more than showing up on a Sunday, so much more than just phoning it in with our, with our, our checklist that we've come to church, but it's truly pursuing you with our heart and with our soul and our mind, our strength. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to have conversations about this. I encourage you to talk about it. I encourage you to be vulnerable with your spouse and with your kids. I'm calling myself to that. Ways that we need to continue to grow in these areas. Again, none of us have it all together. None of us have it perfected. But this is the conversation piece to have to have as you walk throughout your journey of life. Let's stand together as we have the benediction. Know that you're known and you're loved, you're seen. If you're a guest with us again, we're so glad you're here. We'd love to get to know you over underneath the big C at some point this morning. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and grant you peace. And you're rising up and then you're laying down and you're going out and you're coming in both now and forevermore. Amen. Have an awesome week. We'll see you next Sunday.